Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Peter Ruback. I'm the chairman of the 20th Century Society. For anyone who doesn't know, the Society is the organization that exists to protect the best post 1940 architecture and design. Uh, we're a member organization and a charity, and you can find more details about us and about what we do on our website. I'm now delighted to hand over to Elaine Harwood, who's going to introduce our distinguished speaker, Alan Powers. Hello everyone, um, you can hear me tapping. Um, it's a great ple pleasure to introduce our very first um, caseworker back when the society was the 30th society and of course former chairman. In a way Alan needs absolutely no introduction from me but um, if you're not a member perhaps you won't have been on his May or uh, visits it's all based in the days when we got out to places or heard him lecture and he's doing a lot of teaching work at the moment and is currently chairman of the art workers guild so um i think straight over to alan and i'll be following the chat we'll take some questions afterwards and um either I'll read them out. Time for a couple of live ones, I trust. And uh, I'll let Alan take it from there. Thank you, Elaine. Um, here we go. So um, this is a second version of a lecture I gave in 2017 um, as part of a series, which we are, in a sense, recreating now. Uh, and the idea was to give a, a simple introduction to the different subsets of style that uh, can be found in the 20th century. And this is a subject, I think, of endless fascination. Uh, modernism isn't necessarily the first one chronologically. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be talking about Neo-Georgian, uh, which you could say comes before. But uh, all the same, uh, it is probably for most people the central event of architecture in the 20th century. And there are some things about it that are very immediately recognisable. Uh, this is the uh, building in a period image that was used to uh, promote this lecture. It's uh, flat roofed, it has concrete construction, uh, it is painted white, uh, it is a seaside building, uh, denoting uh, fresh air, um, leisure, uh, recreation, the new body in the 20th century, health, etc. Uh, it is even designed largely by a German emigre architect. Uh, these are all characteristic um, modernist things as far as England is concerned. Uh, this is a way of designing that comes from somewhere else and we receive it gratefully or perhaps not gratefully as the case may be. Um, so uh, I'll move on because here is another uh, perhaps prime example. This is has been a French national monument since the 1960s. Uh, it was a house that was quite difficult to live in. I doubt if many people spent many nights in it before the war when it fell into ruin and then came back as a national monument. It is now full of architecture students. Um, so it's a, a, in a way an illustration of the fact that modern architecture has a very strong symbolic force. Uh, it has been and remained the core for teaching architects um, into the present. Uh, this is part of the curriculum, this is something they have to know, um, and whether that's a good thing or not, I'm not so sure. I don't know if they usually really understand what it is even, but it's beautiful, it's moving, it's poetic, uh, it's not functional at all. Uh, this is one of the issues I want to address, but I'm going to start uh, by um, here flagging up three of the essential 
uh, parts of the definition of modernism. You reject the past and uh, replace uh, historic styles with abstract form. You welcome in new technology, which uh, may help you to design the building in the sense that it will show you uh, what it should look like in place of the previous paradigms. And with these uh, tools of uh, efficiency and clarity of form, you will improve society. Uh, and uh, so these are the three, I think, always rather unstable legs of the tripod. You can get two at once quite easily. The third one is always hard to incorporate with the others. Why am I taking you back to the 17th century at this point, you might ask? Well, in many ways, the story starts here. Um, you could take it further back even, but uh, this is a symbolic moment in French architecture when the great Italian Baroque architect sculptor Gian Lorenzo Bernini was brought at great expense to Paris in his old age to design a new front for the royal palace, the Louvre. Uh, this is one of the designs he produced, which is nothing if not Baroque. Uh, and what is fascinating is that after this big effort to bring him there, they rejected it and they built this instead by uh, Claude Perrault, who wasn't even an architect. He was a member of the court, a scholar. Uh, he did design buildings, but he wasn't born and bred. Uh, it is a very accomplished and effective design which sets the course of French architecture really from there onwards. Uh, compared to Bernini's work, it is uh, linear, it is rational, the columns are um, seen on the whole to be doing the work of holding up the building. Um, it is flat fronted. Uh, these are characteristics that uh, carry on through the French tradition and are part of its transition eventually into uh, what we think of modernism. Um, these characteristics were backed up um, nearly a century later by the writer Antoine Chier, who um, was rejecting not Baroque but its successor Rococo and calling for a sort of clean-up of classical architecture. Remove all the bits that don't have a reason to be there. Uh, so this spirit of clean-up um, goes back uh, a very long way uh, and this had a huge influence from the 1750s onwards. The idea that architecture could be treated as a rational philosophical exercise. It's not just about uh, making agreeable shapes or indeed just useful ones. It has something tough at the core of it, which is based on nature and antiquity, as that uh, diagram drawing frontispiece shows. Um, and another much less well-known theorist of the same period, uh, a Venetian um, monk called Carlo Lodoli, who uh, proposed really in conversation, he never wrote this down, other people wrote it down for him, as in this book you can see here, that um, reason and function, uh, and what he really meant was the sort of load-bearing function of architecture should be the basis for form, and uh, the only thing you can point to is this window um, off the street in Venice, but that odd sill with a sort of apron is meant to denote that there are um, physical forces at work there, and this is sort of a diagram of, of what those physical forces are. Um, let function be the representation, he said. Uh, so this is a modernist idea that goes underground for a long time, but was there. Function became almost a synonym for modernism, um, and for some people perhaps it still is. Uh, these are some subsets of the idea of function. Uh, Lodeley's idea of a sort of mathematical metaphor uh, that was a critique of the classical system of ornament. Um, then the idea that function is a biological metaphor, uh, that uh, it is like the skeletons of animals, where the uh, French um, biologist Cuvier um, was very influential in framing the idea that this is how things ought to be, uh, that the, the skeleton sort of denotes the 
essence of uh, the character of the being. And then uh, number three, uh, coming largely through American writers, um, that it's a biological metaphor, that uh, plants um, display function and they are what we should be looking at as a, as a model. Uh, number four is not uh, so much a, a, an extra definition, but it's three German words um, which all more or less denote function as in English. So uh, one of the problems with this word is that it means many things, um, but it oversimplifies. Uh, Sachlich is uh, sort of the thingness of architecture. Zweckmassig is uh, performing a... Um, a particular purpose and uh, funktionell is really a borrowing into uh, German but it's the, the word we're familiar with. So it's very often the case that we lose the subtlety of ideas through uh, the lack of uh, vocabulary in English. Uh, an illustration here of what Viollet le Duc meant in terms of you know, the forms uh, deriving directly from uh, construction um, and his idea of Gothic uh, became a very powerful one, as you can see here, matched with a Cuvier skeleton. So you sort of, in your mind's eye, you strip the building back to its bones. Uh, and here is something that he tried as uh, an experiment, really, in a drawing. Uh, what would a building look like if we used iron the same way that Gothic cathedrals used stone? We could do different things. But this is a quote from John Summerson. Uh, rather a long one, I'm afraid, saying, well, it doesn't really work, does it? Um, unattractive and fascinating, he says, very summers. Um, in a sense, uh, the British, almost by accident, steal a march on iron construction with the Crystal Palace, uh, with Paxton, and then don't really do anything about it. So um, our uh, heritage is kind of buried in the revivals and eclecticism of the 19th century. Uh, the Crystal Palace will appear later in the lecture in quite an interesting way, I think. Uh, meanwhile, in France, uh, reinforced concrete is developed as a, a workable technique and then spread all around the world. And this, in a way, more than a metal frame, uh, allows for architecture to do different things that it hasn't done before. Um, it is the 20th century material. So that uh, just on the cusp of 1900, you have a building such as this, not in the Hennebeek system, it has to be said, but a, a rival system. Um, simplifying form, but still in this case, reminiscent of Gothic. Fantastic building, visit when you have a chance. And here, um, rather more speculative, Anatole de Bodo, um, sort of envisaging a skeletal building with a lot of glass in it uh, that can be sort of infinitely extended. But in England we have John Ruskin uh, and uh, he leaves an enormous legacy particularly in his uh, arguing about ar architecture really in association with Gothic that uh, one kind of architecture is morally good and uh, another kind, in his view, classical, is not. Uh, and this was uh, following partly on from Pugin's promotion of Gothic, but never before have styles been accorded so much uh, loaded value, uh, which has nothing to do with how they actually perform or are perceived by most people. But the people in the game, as it were, the architects and the theorists, take this on board in a very big way and the fervor of modernism, the fact that it is a faith, you are a convert, you are part of a cause, uh, through your actions the world will be made uh, radically better. Uh, this has its roots in the 19th century as well. Uh, there is uh, what we might call a Ruskinian building, it's a contentious thing to say if you're among 19th century specialists, but uh, a, a re-looking re at uh, medieval, uh, making it something it never was before. Meanwhile, the Germans are developing worry about style. I think this was widespread, but this um, book title, In What Style Should We Build, becomes a question that nobody can escape, however 
happy they may be doing um, Renaissance, Queen Anne or whatever, it's nagging them. Uh, the feeling that every other age has had its own style and somehow the 19th century doesn't have one. So they're all looking for, for a sort of messiah in a way, something that will come and rescue them from this unsatisfactory condition. Um, and one of the sort of precursors in late 19th century writing uh, is uh, a huge emphasis on the idea of space that architecture really is about space. There's nothing else that matters. So this is not like the French idea that it's about construction and reason. Uh, for the Germans, it's about experience. Um, and here are a couple of quotes from uh, well-known texts of the time. The English were very slow on the uptake about this, I have to say. Only in 1914, with the writing of Geoffrey Scott, do we get anything like an echo of it. And even then, I don't know how deep that went. Uh, but for people who specialize in the study of modern architecture, uh, this is the key thing, that uh, through the enhanced building technology with its wide spans, openings, large pieces of glass, you can create an architecture that does something different with space um, to anything that's been done before. Uh, you can, of course, uh, build tall buildings much more easily, as Louis Sullivan did very beautifully, um, creating his own ornament. Uh, you can generate exciting spaces without any particular technological input, as Frank Lloyd Wright did with enormous skill uh, through a huge number of buildings over a great length of time. This is just one of the earliest ones. And here, where he uses other forms of technology, as well as just structure, this was a fully sealed air-conditioned building um, with the air conditioning beautifully integrated in the vertical towers uh, close to the four corners, sadly demolished. Meanwhile, um, what we bring from the USA in the Edwardian years uh, is not really that, but the technology of the steel frame and what the Americans uh, actually liked doing at the time was covering it up with uh, classical columns. So here is Selfridges under construction. I love this photograph. Um, we have a few moments and they are all too easily forgotten. Here the city architect, um, engineer in Liverpool, John Brodie, the man who invented uh, the football goal net, isn't that extraordinary, um, built these uh, concrete slab um, flats in Eldon Street still standing until 1964. Uh, the bottom photograph shows them sort of on their last legs. They don't look modern. Uh, they have a few little Tudor sort of um, details, uh, but the construction is totally modern. You can see in the upper photograph, they built a scaffold. They, they brought um, concrete slabs from a factory, lifted them up and stuck them together. And the, the whole thing was still working remarkably well. Um, but there is a sort of disjunction. We get modernity without modernism uh, in the 1910s and the 1920s by and large. Uh, and you could say the modernity of construction is enough. Uh, who needs modernism? Uh, but in Europe, uh, various brands, various flavours of this new thing are developing. Here is Adolf Loos, who is really very fundamentally a classicist, but stripping down, simplifying, writing brilliant polemic articles. Uh, you have Auguste Perret in France, um, building with concrete and classicizing his concrete as well, um, very beautifully. You have uh, Peter Berhans, also essentially a classicist, but again, particularly when building an industrial building at the top, uh, stripping it away, um, exposing the frame, um, making a, a something sort of poised on the edge between a classical temple and a, and a, a brute factory. Um, but uh, space remains the, the goal, uh, as this uh, quote from a famous book uh, suggests. This is where something new happens really through art as much as anything else. Uh, the Cubists have discovered a new 
way of representing space. Perspective is over. Um, Walter Gropius, um, in one of his earliest buildings, uh, somehow captured this quality, although there is much that's quite conventional about this, his glass corner, the transparency, the illusion of a complete glass facade, these are all significant things. Also a very interesting um, project, um, enlightened industrialism. Uh, moving on into the 1920s, now the horse is fully mounted and galloping um, with the Bauhaus building in Dessau. Uh, with that great glass curtain wall. There was actually nothing technologically innovative about that. If you look at pictures of the Steiff Teddy Bear factory from 1902, it is a building completely covered in glass, but it never got in the books. Uh, Gropius, however, was rather good at his self-promotion. Uh, there is a view from the inside showing this um, glassy effect of looking through uh, one prism, as it were, through another with reflections. It is, it's a great game. It makes it an exciting experience. And note also the colours um, that uh, are missing from all the early photographs. Um, here is Gideon about that very building, which he sort of placed as the pinnacle of the space-time conception. This is the architecture of uh, Alfred Einstein, Albert Einstein's um, physics. Uh, in the Soviet Union, um, there are exciting experiments going on which uh, could do with uh, much more explanation here, but I am rushing, as you can see, because we don't have all that much time. In the Netherlands, art and architecture come very close together, uh, and there is this um, idea of, of a sort of unity of uh, painting and, and um, architecture. Uh, with coloured planes um, denoting form, uh, a wonderful idea that never, I have to say, really takes off. Um, the uh, sort of king and leader of all this, though, becomes Le Corbusier. Um, and it's curious to think why he had a certain genius, I think, not only as an architect, but as a polemicist, promoter. And this book, above all, is the one that crossed the channel and which English architects and students knew about. Um, because you learn French in English schools, uh, they could even read it in French before it was translated in 1927. And um, one or two of them said, there's nothing in it, it's just Ruskin all over again. Uh, and in a way they were right, but it, when you, you bought this book and you joined the cult uh, in most cases, uh, his five points of the new architecture is really something that became famous later, but he was very good at providing formulae that even today students can remember five things. Um, but I prefer this um, page, as it were, from Le Corbusier, from a later book, Precision, which wasn't translated till the 1990s. But this is Corbusier Mark II, as it were, or maybe Mark III or IV, because he went through a lot of transformations. And uh, the way he describes it in the text is, um, you're going to eat your lunch, which is the plates. Uh, and then when you finished your lunch, chewing on techniques, sociology and economics, you sit back in your chair, you light your pipe, the little bird of inspiration appears, and up in the clouds, you get poetry. So all this hard work um, with facts and machinery is only, uh, the plate, the dinner plate, off which you will then eat the delicious meal. Uh, the beautiful part comes after. And I think even now, uh, people who attack Le Corbusier don't get this. They don't understand that he is a poet. Um, you may not always appreciate the poetry, but it's there, uh, and very consciously there. Uh, and this is a building at this turning point where he begins on a new pathway uh, using here his rough rubble stone, using a lot of color, uh, and it leads on from there to a, a project such as this. Um, gone are the five points of architecture almost entirely. Uh, we're in another territory and what this stands for um, became uh, popular in England. Uh, many architects, they had to sort of go through 
the initiation phase of doing a, a, a smooth white house. Um, but having done that, uh, they moved on in the 1930s because this was now the game uh, and they caught up with it. Uh, this uh, romantic modernism, this regionalism, uh, this slightly collagiste sort of composition of different materials. Um, not, however, Eileen Gray, this is back in the 20s and the, the pure modernism period, but this is a way of showing um, the interior as being in so many ways more important than the exterior. Uh, it's the sense of the room and the view out of it. The exterior is merely a sort of transitional veil. Um, here the rather wonderful effect of stenciled colour uh, onto a black and white photo to sort of highlight um, the geometric forms. Um, Mies van der Rohe, um, in so many ways the sort of the third one in the trio uh, of the masters, uh, along with Gropius and Corbusier, possibly right there as well, it depends how you're counting them. Uh, the Tugendat house, perfect job, wonderful clients, very rich, uh, lovely site, um, the opportunity to do a complete interior with furniture, with this um, really, uh, this is the great demonstration of the open plan, um, but very structured. Every piece is placed exactly uh, to create spatial forms. Uh, the materials are luxurious, the marble veneers, the wooden veneers uh, in the house. But while this is um, as it were, Mies van der Rohe's Rolls Royce. Um, I'm going to show you another house, much less well known, but recently restored and capable of being visited in Berlin, the House Lemke. Uh, really, the last moment you could build a modern house in Germany uh, before the Nazis put a stop to it. Uh, and this is so simple and not an expensive building. And I don't think photographs fully convey just how charming it is. Uh, I went there. And I just thought, yes, I'm very happy here. I can stay here a long time. Nice sight. Um, you can see the view out of the window there. Uh, the lawn goes down to a lake. Um, it's part of a, a row of houses. But uh, looking back at the building itself, it's, it is, as uh, Mies like to say, by nah, by nah nichts. It's nearly nothing. Um, and how right he was and how brilliant he was, uh, I think, here and elsewhere in making that work. Um, so that's another aspect of modernism that we, I think, find it hard to appreciate because of what I said, the photographs can't fully convey it, you really have to be there. Um, this is another building, um, well that's obvious isn't it, uh, but an amazing one. This is one of a kind, uh, there's nothing else like it from that period. Uh, one of the oddities is it was a sort of sleeper people didn't know about it. Although it was published in the English weekly magazine, The Architect and Building News. It was the only English magazine that picked up on it. Um, quite, quite interesting. Uh, still beautifully preserved, uh, visitable, but only with a certain amount of uh, difficulty. And as for this year, I think write it off. Uh, but we have had This was a play to me for a face for pigeon tobacco, coffee, and chocolate in um, Rotterdam. And um, uh, the architect who did a major restoration on it uh, said that uh, this is. Uh, an example of rationalism in modern architecture. It's a grid, the rooms are not shaped to a particular purpose by and large. Uh, it's an all-purpose um, adaptable space, as a factory usually is. Uh, this, on the other hand, um, uh, another famous building of the Dutch modern movement, is a, a, a functionalist building. Uh, here, all the shapes are very precise to fit particular activities of a, uh, um, a sanatorium for diamond workers who had breathed in too much diamond dust into their lungs. So this idea that the program will design the building for you 
is a very powerful modernist idea, but I think ultimately mostly a fallacy. Um, there is seldom a program that is so specific. Uh, it also is a hostage to the future because um, in this case, the diamond workers didn't need it anymore. It fell into ruin and was only rescued um, at great expense by the Dutch government, uh, beautifully done. Um, but it was very hard to find a use for it. Uh, the Vanella factory is being converted into a sort of multi-occupied workspace. Um, it's worked very well. Modernism and leisure I touched on earlier. The idea of um, you know, stripping down to your bathing costume, or maybe even less than that, uh, and uh, enjoying the sun and the fresh air, that this is for everybody, it's democratic. Um, a couple of seaside buildings, one in Estonia, uh, and a very similar looking one, uh, slightly earlier in Norway, which I visited, had a wonderful swim in the fjord in June, it wasn't cold at all. Um, those uh, sort of concrete mushroom shapes are dancing platforms, so you, you swim, you eat and drink, you dance. This is very much of the period. Um, we have our own equivalents, uh, Bex Hill, uh, perhaps so well known, I don't need to illustrate it, but I thought I'd show this instead. Um, a building which has been uh, very recently refurbished, I couldn't even find photos of it, but the Scottish equivalent. So um, there is a, a spread of this, this idea of leisure, of popular leisure, um, in many places. Architecture for the grind of everyday life here. Yeah, Charles Holden, a much older architect who worked his way into modernism and I think in most people's opinion did an exceptionally uh, clever job with his underground stations as a sort of formula that could be varied um, with uh, a nod to Englishness through the beautiful brickwork but also with concrete um, very neatly sort of poised on a cusp between different things. Uh, Owen Williams, an engineer um, who aspired to be an architect with his Boots factory, 1930. It's very dramatic uh, for its time. Um, Ove Arup, the um, Danish engineer who went on to a great career, building a very rare example of an actual building by him here, but a wonderful inventive shape um, that uh, still exists in, after a fashion. Um, but Arab skill helped uh, Bertolt Lubetkin, the Russian emigrate, to uh, build these ramps in the Penguin Pool in London. This, is, I'm afraid, is my only Lubetkin slide, um, but I expect his work is familiar to you. Uh, so we're in now to the phase of um, emigre architects arriving. The idea that Britain must join the club, that members of the club perhaps are coming uh, to us in their um, extremities. Uh, the picture above, I, I rather like, taken by Erno Goldfinger um, and showing a group on the uh, International SIAM conference, which was held on a, on a ship in the Mediterranean, and they stopped off here. And the third one along, this, this, uh, this guy here, this is the Canadian Wells Coates, you can see him again here, um, who became a sort of cheerleader for modernism and um, designer of a relatively small number of significant projects. Um, but there they are, you, you've sort of got it all. Bathing costumes, attractive women, um, classical columns, sunlight, um, holiday, you know, what else do you need? Fast cars, probably. Uh, down below, a rather different image, um, and I never thought of putting these together before, but this is Mars, the English chapter of CM. Uh, celebrating an exhibition they'd put on after much effort and sort of waiting time and they'd invited Le Corbusier to come and see it. Uh, it's said that on going out of the exhibition room he was heard to mutter under his breath, pénible or painful. Um, uh, he wasn't altogether impressed but he was a difficult man to please. So here he is looking uneasy um, with this crowd of modernists who also look pretty uneasy with each other, uh, I have to say. Um, there's quite a lot of tension in the room there, I think. Never mind, there they are. Uh, Godfrey Samuel, 
um, English born, Wells Coates, Canadian, J.M. Richards, architectural writer, Saj Chemayev from uh, Chechnya originally, but English educated, and uh, Maxwell Fry. Uh, we'll see work by not all of these, but some of them. Uh, Wells Coates first, the, the famous, the old war horse, John Summerson called it, of modernism. Uh, monolithic concrete construction of the um, uh, the vision of Jack and Molly Pritchard to have minimum flats uh, for the modern person um, and uh, a building that got into a very poor state but has, has been now recovered and has um, got a, a mythology around it that is a great deal bigger than the building itself. Um, this is more down to earth, the um, uh, Kensal House Flats by Maxwell Fry with Elizabeth Denby, um, where there was a, a real attempt to kind of engage with the users before the building was built to meet their needs. Um, one thing they didn't anticipate though was that the users might use their um, communal uh, sort of carpentry workshop that was provided to make a decorative um, screens for their balconies, which you can see here in this early photograph. But what's rather wonderful is there's another one up there. Uh, Elizabeth Denby, who sort of acted as a manager, she said, that's great. You know, let's have more of these. This shows that people have adopted where they live and they, um, they feel proud of it. And let's have a competition, see who could do the best one. Whereas I think a municipal housing manager at a later date would have said, you can't have that, take it off. Uh, so this idea of personalization uh, and embellishment um, was not really written into the modernist script uh, at all. And that is one of the reasons why people turned against it, I think. Um, here is uh, Marcel Breuer again with York doing a building that was very temporary and quite small, but had uh, in many ways a, a great resonance. He felt it was very important for him, using rough stone, um, as it were, making the link between modernist space and transparency on the one hand, and um, uh, texture, roughness, solidity, uh, physicality, materiality, as architects like to say, of, um, of construction. Uh, Walter Gropius, during his time in England, um, designed, but didn't actually finish the Impington Village College, but this is a, a sort of symbolic building. Uh, people go there, I think, sometimes expecting it will be a bit like the Bauhaus, but it isn't. Uh, and to me, that's what's exciting about it. Gropius had moved on. He'd absorbed this romantic phase in modernism and I think felt it sort of sat comfortably in England. Um, so this is a building that is uh, also very quiet. It's not shouting at all. Uh, it's um, performing like a, a sort of beautiful bit of background um, uh, and it enables life to carry on in a, in a very normal kind of way. So this in many ways is the ethos uh, of English modernism as it carried on beyond uh, the war and into the early post-war period. But this is what Elaine is going to be talking about uh, next week. Um, English modernism was uh, celebrated in this exhibition in New York in 1937 and Henry Russell Hitchcock, uh, famous as a historian and critic, said England is now the centre of modernism because Germany isn't anymore um, and a certain number of Germans have come to England. Uh, the English have never believed this, um, but uh, he really meant it. I didn't think he was um, just trying to pay compliments. I said the Crystal Palace would come back. When this exhibition opened, it was only a couple of months after the fire that destroyed the Crystal Palace in Sydenham. And so they rapidly got of it in its ruined uh, condition uh, and placed it at the beginning of the exhibition and as the frontispiece of the catalogue book. Um, but uh, this was slightly forgotten now, but I think, uh, uh, my extraordinary choice of photograph for the cover of the book though, isn't it? Can't explain that. Uh, the Mars exhibition came a year later, the one I've already mentioned. Here is the 
um, slogan borrowed from Sir Henry Wotton's version of uh, Vitruvius, um, and the opinion was mixed uh, as to whether this was an entirely successful display, but it was certainly trying to appeal and to please to explain something that people found uh, still quite difficult to grasp. Um, J.M. Richards, who we saw in the photograph, um, wrote not long afterwards that perhaps it was time for regionalism, for national character. I've put that with uh, this quote from Christina Thompson uh, from a very good PhD, which you can find online, um, talking about how, in spite of the contribution of German emigres, it wasn't really transformative. We had something already, they contributed to it, but as it were, the train was already moving when they got on. Um, I'm very interested in this building, uh, a slightly later work by Maxwell Fry, because this to me is predictive of what's coming next. This variety of materials, partial display of um, the structure, but not in a dogmatic sort of way. Um, but here I have uh, pages from a letter written by John Summerson, who I've uh, already mentioned. Now, I don't want to go on too long with reading this out, but I, when I found this, first of all, in the uh, Tate archive, because it's a letter to the artist Ben Nicholson, whose papers are there, this seemed to me to say a lot about uh, both the success and the relative failure of modernism. Summerson was never, I think, totally converted to it. He tried. Uh, and this comes about as a result of him uh, writing. Uh, articles um, promoting modernism but not quite believing in it. So this says, I read Herbert's article, it's Herbert Reed, with great interest. I wish I could get hold of it. I'm not sure that I agree with him, though being a bit of a reactionary myself. For instance, I think modern architecture will have to be to retreat simply because the public can't understand it, never will, and hates it like poison must have gables, etc., etc. See if the little house in picture post this week. Flat roofs, people hate them. Big windows, people hate them. The trouble is that modern architects always see a house like this, uh, and there's the picture, whereas the poor fool of a layman sees the same house like this and says it looks like a jam factory, which in nine cases out of ten it does, whereas this looks like what it is, an Englishman's home. On the other hand, the modern movement has completely and irretrievably bust up all the old concepts of architecture. There's no going back. I've tried and tried to think of some way of being logically reactionary and it just doesn't work. But I'm very much against any doctrinaire movements like the Mars Group, which has, I think, proved itself a hopeless flop. Down with highbrows, especially self, up with all reasonably competent architects, whether they do this or this, the leaven will work. Perhaps this is nonsense, but I don't think so altogether. So uh, you can make what you will of that, but I think it does denote uh, a sense that a cycle is over. We've tried flat roofs, it's time to move on. Uh, we won't go back, um, but uh, a phase is, um, is as it were, completed. Uh, this I won't dwell on because time is moving on so fast, but a very popular book on modernism with a page trying to dispel all the preconceptions, um, such as that modern architecture means flat roofs and white concrete walls. Ralph Tubbs is part of the next generation. And perhaps if you want an example of how this transition works, this is um, one. Uh, Taylor and Green thought of themselves as modern architects, but they had in this work in Norfolk villages after the war, made a lot of adaptations, uh, very similar to what Summerson is, appears to be talking about in, in that letter, um, doing something that people will feel emotionally uh, connected to, which I think worked. And in this case, their attention to landscaping was crucial. And landscape has always been uh, a very important element within modernism um, and often neglected. However, if you don't already have it, the new 20th Century Society book on uh, 100 Landscapes and Gardens will 
uh, fill you in on a great deal of this story. Um, I put these pictures in for a number of reasons. One, this is about uh, 20th century society casework, now nearly 20 years ago, but uh, it was very shocking when this listed house was demolished. Um, a rather long story, but the council had at least once given permission for a listed building to, to be demolished, uh, entirely disregarding what the law says about um, the circumstances when this can happen. Uh, this we then fought to um, change uh, successfully. The second time round, the owner didn't want to take a risk, so he got the bulldozers in and we had to fight a public inquiry. Uh, but this, I think, has more significance than just a sad story of a building that was lost. Um, it is that a building such as this have a sort of psychic um, pull that, on us, I think. I've noticed people, particularly standing on flat roofs, go into a sort of trance. Uh, there's something about them that goes way beyond, you know, art or... Um, function or nice place to live. Um, and this next quote, which is my final slide, which I put into the previous version of this, is one way that I think explains it, if you go along with this. James Hillman is a writer very influenced by um, Carl Gustav Jung, um, with the idea that we carry around archetypal um, figures, as it were, uh, in in our minds. So he talks quite a lot about the pua figure, the Latin word for a boy or a child, um, giving examples there. Uh, the child who is uh, a sort of bearer of truth and light and novelty, but also fragile um, and uh, doomed to die. Uh, so these figures, like myths themselves, seem not real. They feel insubstantial. Tales of them say they are quick to bleed, fall, wither, vanish. But their devotion to the other world, they are missionaries of transcendence, is never forsaken. Loony and lonely, lovely and pale, this is the poor touching the earth tentatively. I think that is uh, something profound about modernism. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I can't wait if, if I sort of clap on behalf of 206 of us out there, which wow. is fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, nothing's coming up on the Q&A bit or the chat, but if you've got any questions, uh, Alan has been sufficiently organised that he's given times for talk. Can I just say, I think, that, that thank you, Alan, for kicking us off uh, for this mini-series so brilliantly. And a reminder that one of the great strengths of the 20th century society is that unlike um, other 20th century societies, inverted commas, we're not sort of dedicated to one specific style, and that is one of our, our great, great strengths. So thank you for that. Why, yeah, somebody called Anita. Alan, why did modernist buildings, did you say that modernist buildings are difficult to live in? I'm thinking heating bills, but why, um, how and why from you? Um, well, of course, one building varies from another. Uh, I think I said it at the Villa Savoie, uh, possibly. You did. Um, I... I Yes, the physical comfort was not a thing. Um, uh, sort of sensible insulation, um, disposal of rainwater and so on, notorious. I mean, uh, it, what my point really is that if, if they wanted to be functional, it would have looked very different. I think the look um, took precedence over everything else. 
Thank you. Anybody else? Happiness? No, I've seen one here. I live in Shad Thames near the old design museum. Why did Conran choose this style for the building in 1989? Um, well, it is a conversion of an existing building, um, but it is, they, I think they added a sort of extra 1930s modernist quality to it. Uh, from the 1970s onwards, there was a big revival in white flat-roofed architecture. Uh, and um, there's a brilliant article by Geraint Franklin in our journal on the 70s called White Wall Guys, uh, about people who sort of went back to it and added it in, as it were, to the mixture of postmodernism. So I think it's really a, a manifestation of that trend, which um, is always somewhere there in the background. Uh, and for a design museum, it probably provided the kind of image that was, that was wanted. Somebody's asked you uh, what your favourite building is. Ooh, that's so difficult. Um, I, uh, I would love to be able to visit that um, exhibition pavilion by Marcel Breuer. Mm. Uh, but um, possibly from this period, at least, um, the house designed by Serge Chemayev called Bentley Wood um, it would be my my top one but we'd have to wind back time to take it back to how it was in the 1930s. But another recent successful listing case for you and Yes, Norman? yes, that's right. And someone wrote me wanted to know what the first slide was. What did you show before? Um, well the title slide was um, Sea Lane House in Angering on Sea, um, uh, West Sussex. Uh, if that's the one you mean, because then we dive back into history. Yeah, which I think you might get again next week, but never mind. Um, I'm being reminded that next Monday, 6.30, uh, we've got a special lecture on the saving of L Lubetkin's Dudley Zoo. So that will tie in very well and with the Lubetkin buildings you didn't show in the greatest concentration of Lubeckin's modern architecture is are the buildings at Dudley Zoo which reflect the characteristics of the animals and which have been in and out of turmoil and restoration for as long as I think the last 40 years. Um, so that will be very interesting. Elaine, we've got more questions here. Have we? Keep yes, going. We um, so I will answer um, how, how, politi how, how political was modernism? Were all modernist architects left wing? Well, they, they mostly were to one degree or another. Some of them were extremely so. Uh, it was sort of characteristic of that period. Um, it went with being an intellectual by and large. Um, so that, I think that's the short answer. Um, for not mentioning Alto, I, I did think, should Alto be in here? Um, he, from sort of the early 30s, his work was very popular uh, and his furniture, Britain was the biggest export market for Alto furniture uh, before the war, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, so the, there was an influence. I think it's harder to pin it onto individual buildings at that date. Um, it's the later Alto who has the most visible influence in the 1960s. Um, Summerson and Pefsner. Um, Ooh, Andrew, I, I don't think it's true of Pefsner, surely. No. Uh, and he, he, his opinions sort of move around a bit. He becomes more inclusive. Uh, but there's always a sort of Bauhaus core in his belief system, I think. Um, not so much represented through specific buildings, but through an ideology of um, being modest and rational, not being willful. That was his main word of criticism. Summerson is more complicated. Um, he loved Corbusier's work. I think he understood it very well. He saw the complexity in it. Uh, but the letter uh, that I read out certainly shows him in, in a moment of doubt and scepticism. And 
from that point onwards, he wrote less and less about modern architecture. He had been a journalist in the 30s, so he, he wrote in his, his magazine, particularly Architect and Building News, a lot of unsigned stuff and some very good, his appreciation of the Delaware Pavilion is a wonderful piece of writing. I think he did get it totally, but then he, uh, I think he was annoyed by the attitude of many of the modernists. They got him to do a lot of unpaid work on the Mars Group exhibition. I think that soured him for life um, because he felt he'd been so badly treated. Uh, where does Rudolf Steiner fit in? I think the answer is very little at this date. Um, and he's only ever been really a bit of a cult uh, figure. There are some Steinerist architects around um, and his influence sort of comes and goes. Uh, probably stronger in the 1980s than at any other time, I think. Um, women and women architects. Um, there were some quite notable women architects. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to put in their work. They mostly uh, at this period did um, private domestic projects, although there's a very remarkable factory um, in Derby uh, by Aiton and Scott from the early 30s. Um, but it's interesting you mentioned this. Uh, some of us, Elaine and I and one or two others have been putting together a book proposal for 100 women architects uh, from Britain over the last 100 years or so, uh, which I hope will uh, reach fruition because there are many tales to tell. Um, and uh, it is true that uh, you know, it's, it's, they don't always get the attention they deserve. It's been fascinating finding a hundred, which we have done and more, but um, finding a publisher is currently proving more difficult. Any more? You're, you're better at scroll? Oh, I keep going round and round on this scrolling, trying to scroll too hard. I think with, with Pevsner and modernism, he loved modernism. It was brutalism where he got, he came undone, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, because it was irrational in his view. It wasn't really modernism at all, uh, I think, for him. Right. Well, happiness, everyone. I'm sorry I can't see you all to wave, but um, I think give Alan another virtual clap. Well, as is thank Peter. you very much. And I hopefully see you next week for my talk. And I think Peter's going to say the concluding words tonight. Right. Well, thanks, Alan. That was a terrific lecture. And thanks, Elaine, for, for doing the introduction. Um, uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, could you please think about making a donation to support our casework? You can go to the Society's website and it's on the act action page with a donate button following that. Or uh, even better, you can join the Society and you can find out all, all about what, what that will do and what good things you get out of that. Um, next week, uh, first of all, uh, again on the Society's website, you can find out about uh, a lecture by the West Midlands group uh, on Saving Dudley Zoo. Uh, and then uh, the continuing this, this series, Elaine will speak uh, next Thursday uh, on mid-century modernism. So thanks very much for coming, and I hope we'll see you all next week. <laughs>